In the recent past, I've been involved in setting up an um, energy conservation organization to help with energy fundraisers. And um, I also, this past summer, was working with some interns from the high schools around Worcester and teach them about sustainability. <coughs> One of the things we did was the solar exercises where, where we went out to the community and just assessed what buildings would be good candidates for solar. One of my star students is here today. If you have time, she'll talk a little bit about what she did. Um, my name is Steve McCauley. Uh, I teach here at Clark in the Environmental Science and Policy Program. And uh, I've been living in Worcester for a while. I've been involved with some community groups, like the organization group you mentioned, and, and some other groups. Um, my name is Mike Gutierrez from Next Step Living, um, and we do uh, home energy assessments under the Mass Save program. And we've also, uh, in the past year and a half, been doing a lot of uh, solar with a power purchase agreement, uh, similar to the lease program um, that, um, that Peter was speaking about. Um, we uh, actually did a class with the, with the uh, sustainability class this, this summer, and that was really excellent. Um, my background is actually in education and environmental science. I was a high school environmental science biology teacher for about 10 years uh, until I moved into this role, and I'll, I'll be speaking a little bit about my history, the history of the company, and how we can uh, hopefully help with some community solar projects in, in different ways. Um, my name is Ali Zalkind. Uh, I'm here for the last two years. I ran a pop up in Daddy Waffles here in Worcester. And um, right now I'm developing uh, what I want to be a 100% post petroleum uh, solar thermal and bicycle powered tamale company. Um, so, kind of taking a post petroleum world as a matter of fact and then going from there with the business model. So, that's why I'm here. I'm Halina Brown. I teach here at Clark University, also in the Environmental Science and Policy Program. I'm also a co-founder of, of a, a multi-stakeholder learning group called WAHEC, Worcester Energy, Housing and Community, that started about three years ago with the idea of uh, facilitating housing retrofits in this area, energy retrofits, while at the same time creating uh, good for the community, jobs, training, etc. And we've been meeting um, on a monthly basis, people come and one of the members. So I'm very interested in, uh, in movements uh, in the Worcester area and in the role of technology in this social change agenda. Uh, Jerry Costello, I live in Holyoke, and uh, I teach in a vocational high school, electrician by trade. So I'm interested in, in that end, child creation and training, mm -hmm. and alternative energies. So. Hi, my name is John Sher. I'm with Worcester Earn a Bike, but the reason I'm at this workshop is I live in a nine-story condo. We just had Mass Save come over, and they're going to change out our lights. So that's probably going to save us. There's over, there's like 120 lights, plus the residents who are also eligible for some free stuff. And, but I'd like to see if there's, you know, one of the things I'd like to see is if there's any way we could use like solar energy, maybe passive hot water, to help with our boilers. Because that would even help us to, to decrease our footprint. You know, it's, 100, it's 80 condos, so anything I can do to decrease the, the uh, footprint would be a wonderful thing. Um, name's Harvard Bridges. I am a member of the Global Sustainability Club at Western New England University. And um, I'm here because I really um, enjoy renewable energy. And yeah, so that's about it. Okay. I'm a member of the Boston Workers Alliance. I've been a member of the Workers Alliance for the past seven years. Um, when the Bustle Workers Alliance started, its it, uh, main focus was um, for social change within the community and um, being a political activist. Um, integrated in the, in the course of time, we also fought for social change for the reintegration of um, ex-cons coming out of prison uh, with quarries and helping them in, uh, reintegrate into the normal public and uh, working society. Um, one of their main problems uh, 
uh, for them is not being able to get jobs and probably go back to school and stuff like that. We help with that. Recently, one of our biggest uh, victories is fighting for the quarter reform. And um, added to that, I am also the one of the executive members on the board. And added to that, we, I myself started a, a new co a co-op, ongoing co-op. the reason why I'm invited here today. Um, it's going to be a recyclable co-op. And uh, one of the things I just made a new friend uh, and colleague here is having something called um, a zip by zip scooters, which are electric scooters being charged by solar power and being all around uh, Massachusetts. Uh, easily accessible by the community and uh, commuters from their homes to their jobs and so forth. Hi everyone, <clears throat> my name is Vanessa Adell and I am a grad student in sociology at UMass Amherst and I'm, I'm studying how communities are responding to climate change and really interested in kind of the link between social justice work and sustainability work um, and specifically interested in um, how to get communities to buy into community projects and work cooperatives. Hi, I'm Joseph Schneva. Um, I'm, I guess, a student um, going into computer science. Um, I'm mostly here just to learn more about the movement because it's, it's pretty new to me and um, maybe to get some experience for um, a, maybe a job or something. I'm not sure. But, um, but I'm also here to be a scribe because um, I'm part of the volunteer um, for coming here. Next Up Living has a, has a, a focus on, on homeowners, but what we were interested in, in starting the conversation today at least was on a community scale. How can we create um, uh, community scale solar projects? And um, Stone Soup is a community center in, uh, in Maine South where uh, we had a fire three years ago and we're rebuilding the, the community center and um, uh, Worcester Earn a Bike is part of it, John Max is part of Earn a Bike. Um, there's uh, lots of different uh, base building organizations that are part of the organization um, and the priority was to rebuild the building. But as we started to rebuild, we, um, we had a vision of of uh, including in our capital campaign for the rebuild um, other sustainability issues. We're doing a lot of energy efficiency on the building. We're doing what's called a deep energy retrofit where, uh, uh, where we're uh, going to be saving over 70% uh, uh, energy savings after um, with the insulation work and, and heating system replacement and things like that. Uh, but we also wanted to uh, contribute to renewables um, in any way we could. And we looked at our roof, and it's only 10 by 10, and it's shaded by the buildings around us. So photovoltaics on our roof alone wasn't going to work. So what we did was we looked at the, the different buildings um, in our immediate neighborhood, um, and what we found were lots of sunny flat roofs. Um, so <clears throat> we've just begun the research stage and soon we'll be approaching these neighbors that we already have a relationship with in different ways um, to, to see if they want to get involved in a, in a community uh, solar project where uh, they could have a, a couple different opportunities to be involved. They could be partial owners of the, the photovoltaic system on their roof um, or they could be, um, they could essentially uh, lease the space of their roof um, for the co-op. Uh, that would be owned by Co by Stone Soup and maybe some of the other uh, neighbors. So Worcester Housing, Worcester Community Housing Resources um, owns this large building right across the street from us. This is Stone Soup right here, um, 14th Street, and then this is the Community Housing Resources um, building, um, and then there are these other two flat roofs, and um, this is the Pettis family that owns the sixth family right here. Um, and they've all been involved in these uh, in community activities in the past, so we're we're uh, hopeful that they'll be interested in, in being a part of it. Now, um, we soon found that we didn't have the expertise just on our own, um, and uh, at the same time, we we're also forming a local organizing council of Co-op Power. Co-op Power is a consumer co-op 
based in western Massachusetts um, that has helped solar installation companies get off the ground, that has done um, quite a bit of uh, solar hot water work. So someone mentioned solar hot water, and that would be a good connection. Um, they do a similar to the Worcester Energy Barn Raisers, where there's groups of volunteers, there's a similar system to do hot water installation. Um, and the big project right now for um, co-op power is, is a, the Northeast Biodiesel, um, which should be launching early next year. But co-op power has done some uh, this, of this community solar work with the Brattleboro Food Co-op. Um, we just installed a uh, 30 kilowatt system on the roof of the Brattleboro Food Co-op in, in Vermont. Um, and uh, through member loans and community financing, that's been possible. Um, and um, there are local organizing councils in southern Vermont, three in western Massachusetts, one in the Boston Metro East area, and one just starting here in, in Worcester. And all of the councils are thinking about community solar in one way or another. So even if you don't have the space on your roof, or if you're not, even if you're not a homeowner, there's ways to invest in solar um, with uh, virtual net metering opportunities. So you can, you can uh, still invest into a, a, a community solar garden or farm um, or, or on a rooftop of a co-op or something and still reap the, the benefits um, of those renewables. Um, so we, we want to invite people to, to get involved in this project, help us think through it. We're in very early stages of it. Um, but uh, uh, we're excited by what's happening around and in the opportunities that are available right now um, with renewable energy credits and, and other incentives that are out there. It's, it's a relatively small window as we understand it to get involved in, um, in solar uh, and to get all those benefits. So, um, uh, you know, we're, we're interested in, in community ownership of the panels themselves as an, op as an option. We'll be talking with, you know, Next Step Living will be speaking about other op opportunities if you don't have the finances to do that. Or, but we're, we're interested in making sure that all the low-hanging fruit, let's say, all the church, huge church, south-facing uh, uh, roofs are not just swiped up by outside companies in a leasing project that doesn't engage people in the process of knowing about the renewables. And instead, that there can be community ownership and building assets and building uh, knowledge and, and, and supporting movement building. This is going to save us money in the long run if we do it right, and that's going to help our movements, our movement building center, um, and it's going to be uh, helpful um, for uh, climate education for all the members that are involved in, in Stone Soup. So that's a little bit of what we're thinking, and we'd love to, to talk about um, how people can, can help us get involved or, or other ideas for community solar projects. Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to have Vaughn talk a little bit about what she did briefly during the summer with us. Just so, I think one of the things that we miss is, that, and I think Mike touched on this briefly, but there is an educational component to all this, and there's a lot of initiatives within the K-12 system on something called STEM, which is basically just to upgrade the skills of, uh, of our schools teaching science, teaching education, math. A lot of, um, we have a severe deficiency in this country with, with a lot of the science and technology. So, um, so it's really important to understand that solar, for, for going solar, for just the sake of clean energy is important, but I think too there's other things that can be tied to that as well. So, Juan, can you just talk briefly about what you did? It was not a really big experience, but it was something. And for one of the days, Next Step Living came and talked to us about solar panels and how it can be affordable. And the other portion of the day was a group of us went out and canvassed the area near Worcester State. And they informed us about the requirements that houses need in order to have solar panels. And I thought that it wouldn't be that hard because they're really little, like about three requirements necessary to install solar panels. But as we went onto canvas, there was a lot of issues with the structure of the roof, obstruction, and people not 
being informed that they can afford solar panels or next step living that makes it possible. And as I, I was talking to people, they were very shocked because they didn't know that this could be so affordable. They thought they would have to buy it and invest a lot of money, which not a lot of people can, but they are very interested in going green and saving energy and being more efficient. I thought it was a really good process and I learned a lot about it. And I thought that it was a really great day to just inform all the students and owners of what is possible for solar panels and how to make it happen for everybody. So initially, what did you do in the class? What, what, did, what did we do there with, with uh, the computers? Um, we went online and we searched houses around that area to campus and we checked if it was facing south, which is the correct position, um, if there's any obstructions or the structure of the roof. And on computer, it looks completely different from actually going out and doing it. So on the computer, we had, everybody had these five houses and we, when we actually went out, there was every group of, had about maybe one to two houses that fit all the requirements and were interested, which was really difficult because it was a very large area and we could only find two to three houses. Can I just add to that? I, I think your experience is interesting because that's what we see is that only about 15% of Massachusetts homes are eligible, like can do solar of direction and shading obstruction. So you're kind of seeing. Uh, those numbers, one in five, about twenty percent of the people were good, right? Out of the people you saw on, on the on the computer, um, so that's why I think these community. Uh, I'm sorry, but I think the community solar programs would be great. People that are not, there are a lot of people, you know, that can't. This would be a way for them to get in on renewable energy. So. And I was surprised to find that a few people who houses do fit the requirements. They were shocked to find out about Next Step Living because they were very interested and they wanted to do it, but they didn't know how to or how to make those means happen. And when we introduced them to Next Step Living, they were very interested and they helped spread the words. I think when we're talking about the necessity of, of transitioning away from fossil fuels and and basically all the alternative, alternative energy out there, the options we have. It's really important to gauge people sometimes one-on-one. -on -one. I think that's what we found out when we were canvassing, is that you know we can, we can talk about this and, and go to presentations on it, but sometimes it just requires that one-on-one -on -one engagement. And, um, and, and I, people responded really favorably to it, I think. Did they follow up? Do you know? Um, I actually would have to ask, I think, Mike, because he's in the loop more than I I would be able to check, but I never uh, got a list of all the, the homes you, you actually eventually went and visited. Um, but I think what I could add is that um, we, yeah, this is something that I, would, I think we can bring. We do do a, a referral program and, and donation program, so to support projects, even if we couldn't be part of it, um, we do get referrals for people that help us do outreach and canvassing, and maybe this could be something down the road where it could be groups of volunteers that want to help out from those groups where donations from people that actually follow up do the systems, we could make sizable donations to an already existing project like, um, they say, Stone Soup. So um, we've done that with um, Soul Solution, which is a company that does, uh, or a nonprofit that puts solar panels on uh, schools. And we were working with them to do outreach and, and not, not so much canvassing. I think that's kind of unique to something we were just kind of practicing here, um, where people, everyone that would uh, do a solar project would, you know, with us from that canvassing and outreach and education, uh, would be able to, we would make a donation to their, their local school, so the local project. So that's one way I think we could also add on. Uh, but yes, um, one thing I think we do is we keep a really, um, we, we want to know, we're data driven, so we want to know what we're doing and how we're doing it well. So as part of these projects, we'll be able to give, you know, how much impact you'd be having the community on the residential side and, you know, how that would work, yeah. I, I recall reading an article uh, not so long ago uh, about uh, the, the, uh, the critical mass of projects on the same street that lead mm. everybody else to adopt solar. 
So I don't know what I don't remember what that critical mass was, but it's been established that if there are enough people within a certain geographic areas that will install solar, then the barrier to overcome for the for the uh, for the rest of the people. In other words, if you knock on their door, you may not even have to go canvassing there anymore because uh, people uh, people are interested in what other people are doing. And, and then, so, are you? I mean, do um, you experience that too? In for your sure, work? Um, definitely. Anecdotally, I don't have any numbers, but that definitely helps. And we try to use that in our outreach. We try to do like open houses where we we have done this with. Um, People have done solar, and, and um, they will invite people into their homes, and we'll do a small presentation with like five or six families. They'll go check out the panels, look at the, the inverter system that's in you know near their um, their breakers, and they'll talk about their experience with the with how they they were able to get into it, what their electric breaks are. So yeah, I mean for sure, there's people as people seem to see this as a normal course of action if you can do it, it becomes easier. I know I heard you mention um, most of the times how the word is spread by through with the mouth, but um, each community has a local television station. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought of targeting the local telev television station in each community to spread a word of the solar power for the communities uh, of that sort? Sure. Um, as far as the further reach to the communities that you all are targeting or going to or going through? Yeah. Um for sure. Uh, we've done that in other communities, have been on local cable access shows, um, doing uh, we call like some er earned media, working with um, you know, local newspapers and we'll say uh, have a, someone that's big in the town or influential in the town go through an energy assessment or a solar installation perhaps and just sort of invite media to come and once people see, you know, oh this is the town councilman or a selectman or whoever it may be doing this, it, it, boosts up our, their awareness, you know, and we try and link that with um, events or future presentations so that in the article there could be, you know, some type of path people could follow. Um, we don't usually do traditional media um, as far as the company goes, and that's why my job is here, because um, we do feel like working with community groups is the best way to reach out, out and, and really um, get deeper um, adoption within the community. So working with uh, whatever you know, REC or the barn raisers, um, you know, other groups, and we, you know, that's how we, we do it. But for sure, and I think it would come from say, if you had a connection with that local cable access show, and we were working together doing, you know, you would in, invite me or something like that, you know. So it would be happened sort of organically and, and through a collaborative piece. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, Jeff. I'm interested in how this uh, could operate as a community system, so maybe you can speak to this format, I don't know, or any of you really, but um, I guess uh, it's, it wouldn't be a microgrid, right? So it would be uh, just starting off the grid. So I know it's, you're just starting to think about it, but uh, what would the option be for, how would it be organized sort of as an institution or as a co-op or organization? Uh, one thing I've heard of recently is what the Hanover Theater has done downtown. I don't know if any of you went to that event. Few weeks ago, where they described how they're getting 80% of their energy from uh, from solar, and the way they're doing it is that they have a solar farm out in I think Grafton that produces the energy, and then they have a kind of a certificate with National Grid where they say this energy we're producing is for the Hanover Theater, so they can pretty much claim that it's directly, you know, they're kind of producing it even though it's off-site. So I wonder if it's that kind of thing where it would just feed into the grid, but they say that this is for this neighborhood, or if there's some other more direct way in which they're making. So there, um, <clears throat> it'll be a combination, is our idea. <clears throat> um, depending on how, how much the, um, the different neighbors want to get involved in, in the project. Um, but yes, the idea is to do it kind of with that virtual net metering idea, right? So that's what you just explained, where, where people can, um, can invest on a, on a site that's not exactly on, on their property or um, on a different property, but use but use that energy, those energy credits, those energy uh, certificates, um, for as renewables for for that property. Or, and there there is the option to have direct energy usage for for your property. So there could be it could be a combination. It could be um, um, that stone. You know there are ways of doing um, if we all. 
network together to do a, a, a small net, but I don't think that's the way we're going to do it because we're all in, in the grid and, and have the opportunity to, to sell back to the grid when we produce enough to. Um, and uh, the ownership structure of that is, is still to be determined, um, but the idea of it would be um, a cooperative model where, um, say, Worcester Community Housing Resources wants to invest in it as well, they, they're part owner of that co-op along with Stone Soup. Um, and uh, but it's still it's been it's still in the in the works being uh, established. So any other ideas people have for it? Good. What about the A1 building? Since they're rebuilding that at the moment, wouldn't that be? And the roof is probably pretty. They probably redid the roof, so it probably wouldn't have a lot of problems putting things on the roof. I'm imagining that a lot of the roofs in the neighborhood won't be able to sustain the the solar because. Of of age and stuff. Right, so that's another research part. The A1 roof that I just talked about right, is right here. So that's that's a potential too. Um, uh, the owners <coughs> of these two that are not, um, they're not as community uh, connected. Um, they're they're uh, corporate owners that we have no connection to of uh, engaging with them. But um, physically their roof is might be viable and it might be more viable. So if these neighbors aren't um, interested, then, then that would be a, a potential uh, area as well. And again, so because it's virtual, it doesn't have to be right there. Right. But the, the appeal of having it right in the neighborhood would also be educational one, right? Um, and a community connection one. We want to have long-term long relationships with our neighbors for community building purposes, not, uh, not just a financial arrangement or uh, a, a common commitment to, to climate mitigation stuff. It's also about community building. So that's why we've, we've picked these neighbors first, but it'd be great to, to, to branch out as well. That might, be, that might work out for both of you, you know, right. for, profitably. Yeah, and, and Co-op Power has models for scalability of these projects. You can start with a small core, and you can grow large, and for replication, too. Um, so we're, we're hoping uh, to, to gain from some of that experience as well. It looks like that three kings would be the best. That one, um, some of those other ones have a lot of obstructions, like two king street, seems to have a lot of HVAC equipment or something on the roofs. I was just, just from looking, I look at a lot of roofs from, from time to time, but that one's nice, nice and uh, cleared out of any obstructions. Is some, something you also want to think about when you're looking at roofs? How does the roof have to, what, what is the structure of the roof? I mean, that must be important. So, I mean, if the roof is at a certain age, it's not eligible, or? Um, like, if the roof is old, obviously it's going to have to be replaced. You don't want to put, you know, it, some it, more structure on it, right? It's definitely different. I mean, you're going to need engineering uh, companies to come out and assess the, uh, you know, the structure of the roof. Um, it, it is a little different residential. On the residential side, I can tell you, I mean, you have to have a roof that's less than 15 years uh, because those right. the, usually typically the, the the life cycle of the those agreements are up to 20 year contracts um, but it can be also an opportunity where a lot of companies sometimes will even offer to assist with roof upgrade uh, prior to the, the the panels going on you don't want to take them down midway through exactly um, but yeah you're looking for that you're looking you know even really small st chimney stacks or things like that that are up there can uh, add shading and, and really lower the productivity of a, of a system. So you want to kind of look for those those clear roofs. How do you that, John? Um, you know, I'm thinking about what you said, that the way you frame it, that this community solar is, is exactly that. So it's not only uh, a technology that somehow maximizes the location, but it's also about building a community around it. And, but I'm also think I'm trying to just put it all together, you know, what do we try to accomplish? Can we accomplish multiple things by, uh, say, through solar? So you're talking about community building. And I look at these roofs and think about green roofs. Right? Lots of activity somewhere else out there people are promoting green roofs. So here you go and look at all these roofs and you're only looking at them, are they appropriate for solar? And when they're not, you discount them out, right? And you focus on your solar. 
why not just assess all these roofs for what can we do with these roofs? Those that are not good for solar may be perfectly good for, for green, green roofs, which, which are really important in lowering the temperature of the cities in the summer, plus, you know, have create community, people suddenly have green space on top of them. All kinds of benefits. You see what's, I said, everybody is just focusing on their particular thing. And we, um, okay. I'm not finishing the sentence. That's because I don't know how to Just to respond very quickly, just yeah. that stone soup is going to have a green roof on the addition on the back, too. It's going to be a garden mm -hmm. roof, uh, green roof. We, but we're not doing larger assessments that you're talking about. I just, <laughs> my colleague here, I was thinking about the same, I'm along the same line because even though I'm living here in Boston, I'm actually from London. And in Europe, a lot of the roofs are turned into either small, lightweight gardens. Um, also light with green um, growth like lawn, what we call, what you all call lawn here on the ground. They actually grow lawns on their roofs to bring down the heat and bring down, cut down on the cold and also keep the heat and the cold for the different temperature change. And that have been going on in Europe since um, I've been a child. Uh, it's strange that it's such a thinking or idea have not reached to here to the United States as yet. And I'd like to throw that to, to Next Step Living as far as being one of the up and coming green company that is spreading the word of, to the people about being and thinking more green. Uh, if it's, um, just like my colleague just said, if it's only solar, it's the only thing they're thinking about for the roofs of the people. Granted that most of these houses are 100 years old and the life cycle of the roofs aren't 100 years old. I'm quite sure that the roofs have been changed a few times or several times to keep up with the rest of the structure. Um, so what is it, um, besides solar power, what is it that the Next Step Living, or is Next Step Living thinking or venturing into anything else but solar paneling for roofs uh, in the near future in Massachusetts? I think as a community project, to, to speak with, to what Matt's doing, um, I think it, if we were able to help with this and open it up to the community, this could be where if we were canvassing or teaching students or volunteers how to look for roof spaces that were good, right? Instead of throwing those out, we could have our ones that were good for solar. You could approach them in, in that way. I, I don't know, if, I was just thinking as you were speaking, but um, there are companies out there and there are uh, community groups that, I know right now they're strictly out there in Boston, but I mean, there's gotta be opportunities either to create that, those things and, you know, to create those types of groups and nonprofits. So um, I think we'd be open to looking at you know, at least sharing information. Um, right now, I don't think we're looking at that. I was just speaking to the energy manager of Worcester, uh, John O'Dell, and he was just telling me that I think the city is going to be putting out some information about actually turning some of these roofs into, like, what you see there, those white roofs right there, um, because that lowers the thermal load on the building, lowers your heating and cooling, uh, I should say, uh, cooling costs in the summertime, um, and mitigates um, our global uh, urban heat islands, if, you know. Um, so. There, there's other opportunities. He was just, we were just speaking about that. So um, I, I don't foresee that. I, I can't really speak to it, but I think um, we could definitely help in that, that ability to you know, look for other opportunities besides solar. We're hoping, we're looking at models of, uh, of job creation, of community ownership that are new, right? That aren't uh, based in, the, in, in old systems of, of uh, of wealth accumulation um, in based on inequality and uh, that support system, you know, um, of white supremacy and things like that. We we want to think of, of new systems, right? So um, the first person we called um, was actually uh, a group that had collaborated with Co-op Power quite a bit in the beginning. It's called PV Squared Pioneer Valley Photovoltaics, um, which is a worker cooperative. Uh, that does solar installation in, in Western Massachusetts. Um, so they they uh, enact a solidarity economy principle in their function as a as a worker cooperative as they do this uh, solar installation work. Um, and so they um, they're actually very busy right now. They're <laughs> they're growing too. Um, but uh, they they were able to connect us with with other people that um, that could work on this. Um, and they're, they've been around for a while, 
and um, are now able to really help build the worker co-op movement, right? So they're involved in uh, a worker co-op network in Western Mass um, called Valley Alliance of Worker Cooperatives, and they um, are active in the National Federation of Worker Cooperatives too. So uh, it, we want to connect these dots. We want to think about other models of ownership and, and, and worker structures as we think about the, the opportunities in solar as well. Um, I go out and I assess houses and I see a lot of houses that look uh, great on, the, on Google Maps. And then when I get out there I realize they're totally unworkable. But um, when it comes to solar water, solar water can be a lot more forgiving than photovoltaics depending on the system you put up there. So I just am wondering is there a way, and I think maybe you can expand upon what you guys are thinking because um, that actually is a way, maybe not on a community-wide basis, but at least on a building-wide basis, you can get people involved in, in a project um, on, on reducing at least the water heating loads of, of the building. Yeah, even the electricity load would be great, too. But, you know, I'm, one of the things that I've been thinking about is, like, you know, because I used to be, also used to be an electrician. And I was an electrical contractor for years. And, you know, structure is important. Our roof is probably halfway through its life. It's a rolled rubber roof, which makes it even more, <laughs> as you would know, it makes yeah. it harder to, to do any structure on it. They don't want to touch it. Yeah, you don't, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you have to really probably get in under the thing. And, but also we'd have to like pipe over the, you know, we'd have to do external piping throughout over the uh, outside to get back down. And, you know, so those are the things that I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about it personally at the moment. I, this, the first project I got was Mass Save came in. And you know, probably saving 20, 20 watts minimum for at least a hundred fixtures, mm. which is pretty good. Plus the outside lights, which is saving another couple hundred watts, of, you know, a fixture. So right there, we're going to reduce our, you know, our footprint. But I'm trying to, I'm just trying to find out more and more about what else I can do to help reduce the footprint. I would love to be able to put in those, uh, the solar lights but it's a concrete ceiling, so there's nothing I can do about that in, in concrete floors. So that would be a wonderful thing if you could just put the tunnels in and have the lights come out, but I don't think you can do that. And anything, so I'm just coming, trying to find any ideas that will help reduce the footprint. Well, you know, just speaking on your building in particular, uh, when we talk about the cooperative economy, um, I think it's important that we can bring in the K-12 school system too. Mm -hmm. Like, if, if we're doing a building that needs a lot of roof work, right. and say it's a hot water system, mm -hmm. we can bring in, you know, the roofing guys, sometimes a lot of the old schools that go out in the community right. and they actually do work, it's hands-on training. Mm -hmm. So in that particular opportunity, then they get the plumbers, the, the plumbers right. apprentices and training at the folks schools, as well as the roofers. And that's a way to establish those connections. Because really, when you're talking about a community, I think you've got to invite all the players. You know, it's got to be the government buildings, there's public schools, it would be great to have PD on those buildings. But also, there's a lot of ways to connect and get different parties involved. Um, you usually typically start small with a few pilot projects. But I just think the urgency of switching, getting off fossil fuels, yeah, me too. necessitates that we take right. you know, some bold. I mean, steps. it would water would be great because we have a chiller and you know it's just an old style system for the whole building. So to just to be able to reduce the use of natural gas to you know to chill it and to and to heat it would be you know a nice savings. Mm -hmm. But again, that's future. I mean, the roof would have to. It's probably about a hundred thousand dollars. So it makes it hard to get anybody up there. Yeah. So, but it's a start. A uh, very important question. Uh, I know we talk about solar powering roofs, but um, is there, and there are so many competitive solar companies out there now, and improving on the um, luminance of the solar panels. Is there one particular solar panel company that, that you work with? for solar paneling these roofs, or there are a number of companies you're working with. Are you looking into the new and improved solar panels, or is there one particular kind of solar panels that you're using? Is it the hand ones, um, tile type, or is the flexible ones that can be shaped to the different um, shape roofs? Because I see you're only looking at the flat board roofs, which are flat, and not many of the roofs in Massachusetts are flat. The reason why, we're in a four-season state, and could be a lot of snowfall. 
And there's a reason why our roofs are more arched than flat. Sure. I mean, just I think an important question to ask. Um, I mean, I can speak to that. I mean, typically, uh, I guess the efficiency of solar panels uh, that we work with are about 15% efficient, which is at the higher end of mm. residential systems. I think they top out at 20%. I mean, I'd, I'd ask some of the electrical people here, but solar just, uh, technology is just not progressed. I know you've heard those tiles and film panels, and I think to make things cost effective, people aren't quite using those because those technologies are a lot more advanced and, and just cost a lot more, where you can get a lot of the same benefits with cheaper type panels. Um, um, but we do work with two Massachusetts-based companies, or at least employing them. Um, we have installers, and we are trying to develop some in-house ability to install, so building up that workforce for electrical um, uh, folks to, to work on these systems. Um, but the, yeah, the panels, you kind of hit, you hit a, 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 you know, there's sort of a technical boundary of what they can do right now. I know you're one of the largest um, growing employers um, for employing people. So you are uh, actually training people to handle, install your solar powering, or just because you're using these two companies already, they already have their own people, or you are actually uh, acquiring more people to work with these people that you have had, that have hired um, to increase, I would say, the workforce. Yeah, um, to be honest with you, what, what I do know for sure is uh, on the weatherization side, we do train in-house uh, the whole time as we bring people up from, you know, uh, whether they just have sort of a construction trade background into weatherization and um, energy auditing, they get building performance to training. Uh, on the solar side, we are building up that capacity. It's not quite there yet, um, but I would imagine we would go down the same road. Right now, I think we leave it up to the contractors to, to figure that out. Um, just to add, with the rebuilding of Stone Soup, we're also offering training to get into the field of weatherization. Um, and um, hopefully with the solar project, it'll, get, um, it'll open some doors for, for uh, young people and others to, to uh, explore these careers and get some connections. So on the rebuilding of, uh, and the energy efficiency work, they're going to get their BPI certification for weatherization. Uh, OSHA and lead work and connection with the, the local unions as well. So it, um, you know, it's, it's piece by piece and, and then the actual, you know, placement into a job is, is a challenge in, in, um, in the region. There hasn't been as many, there haven't been as many jobs created in, in the weatherization field as, as had been projected and probably similar in the solar installation realm. But, um, but that's a concrete example of, of contributing to a, uh, a solidarity economy, right? And, and it's, it looks really different who is involved in that than who is involved in the, uh, the financing of, of these projects. And, and um, uh, so the actual you know, workers and, and it has potential for worker ownership opportunities as well. Um, with about 15 minutes left, we should probably refocus on some of these questions that all these workshops are grappling with, right? So um, what are the areas of green solidarity economy that, that our session addresses? What, what are the different areas and um, what are some of these initiatives <coughs> that can be expanded to, to be better connected with that solidarity economy? So if any people have ideas around some of those questions, that would be great to share. We can get them into the scribe and bring them back together at the end of the day. What about the grid? Solar, if I understand it in a naive way, is totally depends on the on the grid, right? Because you that has to be especially community solar, right? Because you you generate here, you get credits there, so you need a grid that's owned by one big company. Is there is there any um, are there any initiatives out there to try to become independent of the large utilities? There, there's a movement in Western Mass that I'm not super familiar with, but there's, it's, there are municipalities that are trying to do more ownership of the, the renewables that are being created. And, um, and so there, uh, that would be nice. I don't know of any initiatives in Central Mass directly on, on that. Um, so I don't know if anyone else can speak to that. Uh, right now our options are nat national grid or a big battery bank. And I don't think we, uh, you know, can so do the battery. The, 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 really yeah, so at this point. 
city uh, an energy person is does aggregate buying uh, for the town's um, electric. They still have to work with the utility, but they basically get a broker and they just all together get better rates. They kind of go in together and are able to at least negotiate better prices, but it's not like they're breaking away, I don't think, from, from any of the, the big utilities, so. I love the idea of the microgrids, where not only could we produce just in a totally distributed way for each individual house, but that, you know, link the neighborhood so that it's, the solidarity part is linked not just in terms of community, you know, interaction, but really, you know, technically too. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really nice scale for an energy system, mm -hmm. but short of that, and in the near term, when we do have to work with the grid, I think, as you were saying, Matt, there's still a lot of benefit to building this system, building a community that supports it, just to, you know, get it going in terms of the people, you know, even even before the technology is there, in some ways. And we want to have the capacity if need be, um, and especially for more rural projects, that's more appealing, right? To to not, I mean, there's most of the incentives are linked to to the grid right now, uh, energy credits. Uh, other incentives, you, you need to be buying and selling from the grid still. But in the future, those may not be there, and there may be more incentives to have a more autonomous, uh, uh, what you're calling a microgrid, or, or a community-owned system, and, and, or even a battery system. So we want to have that capacity, and we want to learn about those options, even if they're not feasible right now. So. You guys were talking about the educational piece, specifically around technology um, and roof capacity and things like that. Um, now what about the education piece in terms of the solidarity economy? Like how, because I feel like it's so much about the sort of global capitalist arrangements, not just about how powerful capitalism is, but also just how powerful the idea is and how we're kind of all hooked into that idea. So. I'm just interested in kind of the work that Stone Soup has been doing and, some, and other people's ideas about just the education piece of, of another world is possible, another way, like other systems that are more community oriented and more um, you know, worker owned and community empowered, et cetera. Uh, we're just thinking about how to do that. What we know what we're doing right now is documenting each piece of the way, interviewing the workers that um, thought they were just getting into a job training program with Youth Build and now are part of this larger project and have gone to the City Hall to, uh, to call for a responsible employer ordinance that will maintain more local jobs and are, and are seeing all the groups that are coming through Stone Soup and being part of volunteers. So we're trying to document some of that work, but, um, but how to frame that message in a larger way is, is still, uh, that's a very good question and, and it would be great to, to have other ideas on it. One of the things that I, you know, I don't think National Grid is doing this out of the kindness of their heart. Certainly not. You know, I mean, they, we're getting our power basically from two aging nuclear plants, Yankee and Seabrook, right? That's a lot of our power. And, you know, they, they're getting their capacity. So I think that the reason they're doing it is to keep from building another new plant. So that should be something that we should have in our education to say, you know what, this is why we need to do this. We need to. We have to have the grid. You can't have, you can't live without the grid in an urban society. But you can minimize the effect of the grid by putting more solar and more alternative energy sources out there. I think very much so. Depends on why they haven't um, done anything to see stop or slow it down. Because normally that's what they do. If they would, uh, within that capacity of knowing that they're aging and very soon they'll have to build another plant, that they would have been, actually have very high resistance to all this solar power going on right. within the city, in the city, out of the city, and so forth and so forth. And that's a very good point that you just wrote there that a lot of people seem to be sleeping <coughs> on, um, if for the few people who are thinking it and not aware, that we have two very aging old um, plants that are supplying power to, to the state. And they are of the age that really soon that they will either have to build another plant, close down one, build another plant, or rely on added assistance where we are um, looking to form and come in as far as the solar panel of the homes and neighboring um, communities that have the land that could have a little, what we'll see, um, the space put them down on the ground and run the grid, as you just mentioned. And that's something very important. No one seemed to have mentioned that before you. But I, I've been thinking about it. 
So that, I think that's very important. No one seems to be talking about I think, Matt, you were talking a little bit about how there was sort of a small time frame for, for some of these incentives. And some of that is based on like the, the, our, the renewable energy credits that help finance these things are based on a market. And um, the utilities are required to buy a certain percent of their power from renewables. And um, because solar has become so big recently, that that market's actually been flooded with these SREX. So there is this, I don't know, I, not to dissuade anyone, and it doesn't dissuade us really, but there is this danger that like some of that that makes this you know cost effective is is going to be hit a, hit a critical threshold unless um, the state in, in, uh, requires them to buy even more and, and buy even more uh, credits. So that might be something.